Uh, I'm Howard French, and my book is China's Second Continent, How a Million Migrants Are Building a New Empire in Africa. Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me about the title of my book, which includes the word empire, and they've questioned whether uh, it is legitimate or fair to speak about China's engagement with Africa in terms of empire. The first thing I'd like to do is say that this I intend uh, mostly in the spirit of a question. It's an interrogation. I think it's a worthy thing to ask about. I think Africans themselves have begun very actively to ask themselves about this and that it's too soon perhaps to come to any firm conclusions, but there are enough strands to, for many people to begin to think that um, this is something to be wary about and to think seriously about. Um, where we come back to the word imperialism or the possibility of the existence of imperialism, I think, is that, you know, Africa, for, at least for a certain amount of time in the, in the situation I described, found itself with, very, with no alternative partners. It's not necessarily a fault of China's. China saw a near vacuum and swept into it and pursued its... Um, its opportunities as it best saw them there. That doesn't change the fact, however, that for the African parties, there were no other real partners. China was taking over, uh, in a, a very big way, global manufacturing and becoming a manufacturing superpower. And so African countries found themselves essentially with only one big real client, vi viable client in terms of their main uh, exports, which were natural resources. China became the the market maker, if you will. Um, and this gave China incredible leverage in terms of you know, the sorts of deals and opportunities that it could pursue for itself in an African environment and an incredible mismatch between China and the African parties that it was doing business with. The mismatch was due to the fact that Africans didn't have alternatives in terms of the West was disinterested. Uh, the West was not competing with China for the same inputs in manufacturing because of the different structure of the economy in the Western countries versus China. Um, one further thing, China is 1.3 billion or 1.4 billion people, and so you have this massive country called China that is rising and growing very incredibly fast, uh, dealing with uh, this highly balkanized country, continent of 54 countries, many of them, you know, minuscule populations by comparison with China. And so at every level you see a, a, a real mismatch going on here, and this has allowed China to pursue its agenda in a way that African countries have been fairly um, unable to resist or to, to, to deal with. This mis mismatch, I think, is the, gives the sort of lays the basis the, for the beginnings of a kind of imperial transaction between Africa and China. Um, and China, you know, protests vehemently that it is not a he hegemon, it doesn't behave like the West, it has, you know, um, no colonial or imperial history, et cetera, et cetera. But this isn't necessarily, it's, this is certainly not a matter of rhetoric, and it's not even necessarily a question of one's intentions. It's a question of reality, and the reality shows a preponderance on one side uh, and um, a real um, state of weakness or lack of, of options, as I've said, on the, on the other side. And so this is where the beginning of the interrogation, I think. When thinking about why Chinese people decide to go to Africa and how they, how, how they arrive there, um, it's useful to divide the question up into mechanisms and then motivations. Uh, the mechanism piece of it's pretty simple. Um, in Beginning in the 1990s, when Jiang Zemin um, begins to push the go-out policy that China announced of seeking business in new markets overseas. Uh, and China sets Africa up as a priority target for Chinese expansion. Uh, Chinese uh, provincial, typically provincially uh, uh, based state-owned companies begin competing with each other for big infrastructure projects in various places and sometimes mining projects um, in, or in other kinds of industrial projects in various places. And these tend to be big, uh, they tended to be big labor intensive projects where you could have a large work crew of 500 or 1,000 Chinese people going off on a two year contract uh, or something of you know, similar nature 
where they would they would be based in the in the target country for the duration of that contract, carrying out the engineering and construction work. Some small percentage of the people would begin to stay behind at the end of their contracts. They would elect to remain in the country that where they had worked, uh, and set themselves up in business. Then, well, as those people begin to succeed, what you then later begin to see happen is that word of their success spreads back to China by telephone, by QQ, by email, whatever. Um, and uh, so, you know, in their domestic community in Sichuan or Hubei or wherever it might be, people, you know, their friends and relatives understand that th this person who left them three or five years ago is now, who, who left as a very ordinary sort of worker, uh, is now relatively successful in business or sometimes quite successful in business and so this opens the eyes of a whole another set of people to the possibility of migration to Africa for business purposes and this is what I've called the pull factor that has brought successive waves of people um, into the African arena from China to seek new futures for themselves. I don't think that the future of China's relationship with Africa is going to be dominated necessarily by the policies of the Chinese government. I think that the arrival of a million or two million people today, uh, which may lead in five or ten years to three million or five million Chinese people down the road, is itself setting up uh, very powerful dynamics that will very often involve uh, or uh, imply a structural imbalance in terms of power, means, possibility, finance, um, etc., uh, that are going to shape these relationships very powerfully and very often, perhaps almost always, to China's advantage, um, and therefore raise the possibility, certainly make the interrogation a worthwhile one, of whether th there's an imperial dynamic here, uh, and you know to what extent it fits into the long narrative of imperialism we've seen elsewhere in the world, or whether it is a new kind of imperialism that deserves being understood on different terms or on its own terms.